Hey everyone, and welcome back. You know how much we love to really dig deep into the stuff you're interested in? And today is no exception. We're tackling trend following. Yeah, trend following. It's one of those strategies that sounds deceptively simple, right? Just ride the waves of the market, like, well, like surfing. Exactly. Buy when things are going up, sell when they're going down. Sounds easy enough, but of course there's a whole lot more to it. And we actually got a paper that caught our eye. Yeah, this one's by Dobromir Tsochev. It's called, get this, Designing Robust Trend Following System, Behind the Scenes of Trend Following. That title alone makes it sound pretty serious. And trust me, it gets pretty technical in places, so buckle up. But first things first, let's talk about this idea of a clean signal. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more Quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. The paper really hammers this point home. What exactly is a clean signal when we're talking about trend falling? Well, imagine you're, you know, actually trying to surf. You wouldn't just jump on your board and paddle out without, like, checking the waves first. You'd want to make sure there's a wave worth riding. Yeah. Not just some choppy little thing that's going to disappear in a second. That's it. And a clean signal is kind of like that. It's your way of making sure that there's actually a trend worth following, not just random market noise. So it's like separating the signal from the noise. Exactly. And that's where things get a bit more technical. The paper uses statistical hypothesis testing to create this signal. Hypothesis testing. Sounds pretty intimidating. I know, I know, but it's really about using data to figure out if a trend is statistically significant or just random luck. Like, you know, is that new restaurant everyone's raving about actually good or did they just get a few lucky five-star reviews? Oh, I like that analogy because no. you see that all the time, right? A place gets hyped up and then you go and it's like, meh, this is just okay. So you're saying we need data to back up our trend following decisions. No gut feelings allowed. Not when you're aiming for a robust system, no. Now, once you've got this clean signal in place, you can start building what the paper calls your trend-following prototype. Prototype. So, like, the first draft of our system. Yeah. Think of it as the basic framework. It's not the final, polished product, but it gives you a starting point. A solid foundation to build on. And this prototype, is it just for, like, stocks? Or can we apply it to other stuff, too? That's the beauty of it, actually. The paper shows how you can use this prototype across different asset classes. We're talking stocks, bonds, commodities, the whole shebang. Diversification, right? Never put all your eggs in one basket and all that. Exactly. Spreading your risk is key. And this paper really emphasizes that. But of course, anytime you're talking about investing, there's risk involved. It's not all sunshine and rainbows, right? Definitely not. And that's where risk management comes into play. And, you know, that can be a whole other beast altogether. Yeah. Sometimes it feels like you need a PhD in math just to understand all the risk management techniques out there. But the paper does a pretty good job of breaking it down right. It does. It talks about things like risk budgeting and hierarchical risk parity. Okay. Those sound kind of intimidating. Can you demystify them a bit for us? Sure. Risk budgeting is basically about figuring out how much risk you're comfortable taking on each trade. It's like setting a limit on how much you're willing to lose. Makes sense. Don't bet the farm on any one trade, right? And hierarchical risk parity, that one's mouthful, I know. But basically, it's a way of allocating your investments so that one bad apple doesn't spoil the whole bunch. Okay, so you're spreading your bets even further within each asset class. I like that. And you know what else the paper brings up? Something that often gets overlooked. Those pesky transaction costs. Oh, yeah. Those can really add up, especially if you're trading frequently, like trend following often involves. Exactly. And there's also the carry component to consider. That's basically the cost of holding certain investments. Carry component. Got it. So it's not just about jumping on every trend you see. You have to factor in all those hidden costs to make sure it's actually profitable. That's a really important point. And it's something that this paper does a great job of highlighting. Trend following is more than just chasing the latest hot stock. It's about having a systematic approach understanding the risks and managing those costs effectively. A holistic approach, you might say. Exactly. 
Now, where things get even more interesting, at least for me, is when the paper starts talking about options trading. Specifically, it draws this connection between trend following and something called a straddle. Ah, straddles. Vaguely familiar. Remind me what those are again. Well, a straddle is basically an option strategy. Options. Now we're really getting into the weeds. I know, but I promise it's not as complicated as it sounds. Basically, with a straddle, you're betting that an asset will experience a big price move, but you're not betting on the direction. Okay, so it could go up or down, and you still win. As long as there's a significant move, yes. Interesting. So how does that connect to trend following? Well, the paper suggests that trend following, in a way, has a similar payoff structure to a straddle. You're positioned to profit whether the market goes up or down, as long as there's a strong trend in place. I see, I see. It's about capturing that momentum, regardless of direction. That's actually a really clever connection. And then there's this other cool concept the paper delves into. They call it the CTA smile. CTA smile. That sounds Intriguing. What's that all about? Okay, so CTAs, those are commodity trading advisors. Basically, they're like the big players in the trend following world. They manage these funds specifically designed to capture market trends. Got it. The trend following pros. Exactly. Now, the smile refers to a pattern that researchers have observed in how these trend following funds perform over time. And what's the pattern? What makes them smile? While they tend to perform well in both bull markets and bear markets, if you plot their returns on a graph, you often see this upward curve that kind of resembles a smile. Profits in both rising and falling markets. That sounds almost too good to be true. Right. There's a theoretical explanation for it, which the paper gets into. It has to do with something called convexity. Convexity. That rings a bell. Didn't we talk about that earlier? We did. It's one of those concepts that pops up a lot in finance. Okay, so remind me again. What is convexity in simple terms? With a convex strategy, your potential gains increase faster than your potential losses. When the market moves in your favor, you win big. But when it moves against you, your losses are limited. So it's like having a built-in cushion during those inevitable market downturns. Exactly. And that's one of the reasons why trend following can be such a powerful strategy, especially when combined with other approaches. I'm starting to see why this paper is so intriguing. It's not just about blindly following trends. It's about understanding these deeper concepts like convexity and how they can work in your favor. Absolutely. And speaking of working in your favor, another thing the paper really emphasizes is the importance of choosing the right timeframes for your trend following strategy. Right, because a trend that looks obvious over a year might not be so clear if you're just looking at daily price movements. Exactly. You don't want to get caught up in all the short-term noise and miss the bigger picture. So is there an ideal time frame for trend following? Or does it depend? It definitely depends. Shorter time frames, like daily or even hourly data, can make your system more reactive to sudden market shifts. But it also means you might be more susceptible to false signals. That sounds painful. It can be. That's why longer time frames, like monthly or even yearly data, might be better for capturing those long-term sustained trends. So is it a matter of finding that sweet spot between responsiveness and stability? Precisely. And that sweet spot is going to be different for everyone. It depends on your risk tolerance, your investment goals, and the types of assets you're trading. Right. Makes sense. So we've talked about clean signals, building our trend following prototype, managing risk, and figuring out the right time frames. Anything else we should highlight from this paper before we move on? Well, there's one more point I think is worth mentioning. The paper delves into analyzing historical data to see how trend following has actually performed across different asset classes. Yeah, that's always a good reality check, isn't it? Looking at the track record. Exactly. And what they found is that historically, commodities have been a particularly good fit for trend following. They tend to have those nice, clear, long-lasting trends that the strategy can capitalize on. Commodities, huh? Interesting. What about stocks? Equities can be a bit trickier. They're more volatile, and those trends don't always last as long. So it seems like some asset classes might be naturally more suited to trend falling than others? That's what the data suggests. Now, of course, past performance isn't a guarantee of future results, but it's still valuable information to have. Absolutely. All right, so we've covered a ton of ground in this first part of our deep dive. We've talked about clean signals, prototypes, risk management, time frames, and even a bit about options trading and historical performance. It's a lot to take in. It is, but it's all essential for building a robust trend following system. And the paper does a fantastic job of connecting all the dots. It really does. But I think the most exciting part is yet to come. Now that we have this foundation, we can start to think about how to actually apply these principles to our own investing. 
How can our listeners take all this knowledge and actually make it work for them? That's the million dollar question, right? And the beauty of it is that there's no single right answer. Trend following isn't a one size fits all kind of thing. It's about taking these core principles and tailoring them to your own unique situation. It's kind of like you learn how to bake bread. You get the basic recipe down, you understand the chemistry, yeast and gluten, all that. But then you start experimenting with different flours, different flavors, different shapes. I love that analogy. It's about taking those fundamental building blocks and then getting creative. Exactly. And this paper, it's really given us a great recipe to start with. We've talked about identifying those clean signals so we're not just chasing random market noise. We've learned how to build that diversified prototype system, spreading our bets across different asset classes. And of course, we can't forget about risk management. Risk management is crucial. No matter how tempting a trend might seem, you always have to be prepared for the possibility that it could reverse. Right. It's about protecting yourself from those big losses that can really set you back. Yeah. So where do we go from here? What advice would you give to someone who's just starting out with trend following? I think the first step is really to define your goals. What are you hoping to achieve with your investments? What's your time horizon? How much risk are you comfortable taking? Once you have a clear understanding of your own personal situation, then you can start to tailor a trend following strategy that aligns with those goals. It's all about personalization, isn't it? There's no magic formula that's gonna work for everyone. Exactly. And that's why it's so important to do your own research, experiment, and find what works best for you. This paper is a great starting point, but it's just the beginning. It's like it's given us the map, but we have to choose our own adventure. Right. And that's what makes investing so exciting, I think. It's a continuous journey of learning and discovery. Absolutely. And trend following, with its emphasis on data analysis and adapting to changing market conditions, it's a really dynamic and engaging approach to investing. It's not just about blindly following the crowd. It's about understanding the forces at play and making informed decisions. So to our listeners out there who are intrigued by this idea of trend following, I highly encourage you to dive into this paper, Designing Robust Trend Following System. It's a bit of a mouthful, but trust me, it's worth the read. It really is. It's packed with insights, data, and practical guidance that can help you on your trend following journey. And remember, investing is a marathon, not a sprint. Take your time. Do your research and don't be afraid to experiment. And most importantly, never stop learning. Well, that brings us to the end of our deep dive into the world of trend following systems. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you for joining us on this journey of discovery. We hope you've learned something new and maybe even feel inspired to explore trend following for yourself. Until next time, happy investing. And happy learning. 